Hello, everybody. I'm Paul Sobey, and I'm head of product for Storage OS. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about Storage OS, taking a little bit of a deep dive into our internals, um, talking really about, about what the product is and, and how it works. So Storage OS is an end-to-end -end storage platform. And when we say end-to-end, -end, we really do mean end-to-end. -end. We've spent a lot of time thinking about how to get data from disk all the way up to your application. Um, in clusters, in Kubernetes clusters, large and small. So everything within Storage OS has been engineered at Storage OS, um, from the on-disk data format, through to our control plane orchestration, um, our CSI interconnect layers, and so on and so forth. We built it all in-house, um, and, 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 and that gives, gives us a lot of flexibility to tie the systems together uh, holistically uh, and, and, and well. There are some attributes that we'd like to call out here. First of all, uh, we, have, we have no kernel dependencies. So, Storage OS runs perfectly fine on, on, on standard mainline Linux kernels. No extra kernel dependencies, nothing proprietary there. Secondly, we're platform agnostic. So we really will run wherever Kubernetes runs. Um, that could be bare metal, that could be on-premises, that could be in the cloud, that could be in any cloud provider of your choice. Uh, we, we, we really don't mind. If Kubernetes runs on it, then, then there's a, a strong likelihood that Storage OS will, will run it on it also. Thirdly, we're very lightweight. So we think that we're one of the lightest weight footprints uh, in the industry, in fact. Um, a realistic production minimum for Storage OS is about four gigabytes of memory and about a CPU core. You can get away with a little bit less in a test deployment. Um, and of course, if you give us more, we'll very happily use it. So we'll very happily use that memory for caching um, and use those CPU cores to accelerate some of our processes. So we're very highly multi-threaded. But ultimately, we're pretty lightweight. And this allows you to bin pack just a little bit more other applications into your cluster um, and, and, and keep your costs down. The other thing that I wanted to call out is that we very specifically engineer for performance. Um, low latency is an important topic in the storage industry, particularly when you consider the kind of applications that we target storage OS at. So database message buses, and so on and so forth. Um, we need storage not just to be quick, of course, throughput's important, but we need those transactions to be low latency. And particularly, we need those, those transactions to be deterministic low latency. We want all of them to complete in a similar time frame. So imagine if a database is backing a web page, we'd like all of those web page sort of refreshes to complete within the same amount of time and not have those tail latencies sort of spread out, causing a degraded user experience. So we really engineer for that specifically. So Let's look at what a storage OS cluster looks like. Here we have five nodes. These are bare metal nodes. These happen to be uh, anatomically correct HP DL380s for anybody who's spent any time in data centers. Um, but of course, the point is that it's, it's, it's an operating system instance uh, and it's running a Linux kernel and it's running Kubernetes. So we have our five nodes. Each one of those nodes is running the storage OS container. That's uh, exemplified by the cube in green there on the bottom row. Moving up to the middle row, we have a pool of storage. So what Storage OS does is we aggregate all of the uh, all of the available storage on all of the nodes in the cluster. We aggregate that into a pool and we allow volumes to be created within that pool. And those volumes can be mounted by anywhere. So the top row of the diagram indicates uh, those, those gray cubes there. They indicate containers running somewhere within our cluster and we can mount those volumes and we can mount them from any node in the cluster. So the diagram there is a particularly performance topology where we've, uh, we've got the containers running on the same nodes, perhaps in the volumes. That's great, that's very fast. Um, but for ultimate flexibility, of course, it's important to note that we can run these containers anywhere within the cluster. And on that note, let's talk about topologies a little bit. So Storage OS allows us to mix and match here. First of all, we have the sort of the canonical hyper-converged topology. This is where uh, our containers are running anywhere in the cluster, mounting volumes that are present anywhere in the cluster. So this gives a multiple, uh, this, excuse me, this gives maximum flexibility for our schedulers, both for the Kubernetes scheduler to place pods and for the storage OS scheduler to place volumes. So lots of flexibility there. Another model is the centralized storage model. So there are certain circumstances, certain environments where we might like uh, to present and to use the storage only on certain nodes within our cluster. Perhaps they, they, uh, they have a slightly different performance characteristic, Perhaps they've got some more storage mounted or some specialist storage mounted, or perhaps they're under a different maintenance cycle. So we support that centralized storage topology. Um, those nodes on the outside there, that N1 and that N5, they're running storage OS, but in a front-end only mode. 
That's important because, of course, we need to be able to use the storage OS plumbing to provide access to the stateful volumes that are hosted on those central nodes on those two, three, and four. Finally, we have the high performance topology. This is for data intensive workloads, where, as I previously alluded, we might want to run our containers on the same nodes that actually host the volumes to avoid network round trips and so on and so forth. So we support all of these three topologies. And in fact, we don't constrain you to sort of pick one at install time. You can absolutely mix and match at runtime. Um, the beauty of software defined storage is that it's very flexible, of course. So uh, we allow you to choose topologies depending on your workload and your environment. You were talking about the different topologies, obviously, and the aim is to make everything very simple uh, and manageable. Oh. So I was just wondering that given that any kind of storage is good, um, the different characteristics of the different storage um, platforms that you're going to add to this pool, if you like, um, how does the system determine um, how to balance, you know, the performance requirements uh, or determines where um, the, the, the data should be placed? What's the mechanism of doing that and how easy it is then for um, a user or the platform to use it accordingly? So at the moment, um, the storage OS placement schedule that takes into account a variety of factors when, when choosing where to place a volume. So free capacity, uh, node load, recent error counts, and so on and so forth. But at the moment, we really place volumes uh, in a fairly round robin pattern, if you will, um, around the available storage nodes within the pool. But we do have, um, of course, software defined storage gives us lots of flexibility. So we do have some grand plans to sort of enable us to differentiate and, and, and allow some more custom and careful placement of uh, of volumes according to node type um, or characteristic or, or, or you know, uh, on, on any one of a number of different dimensions. Does that answer the question? Yes, I mean, but but there are there manual controls as well. I just make sure that um, things, I mean, you can then choose to place somewhere as a compared to the system making a decision for you. So at the moment, the uh, the placement is, is is fully automatic. There are one or two hints that we can give the scheduler. So we can we can hint at the scheduler that we that we might like to, to send the data to a certain node. Um, and it, it's really con con considered as a, a sort of an administrator last resort sort of sort of balancing effort. Um, but these more automatic placement features will be coming in due course. All right. Thank you. And, and Paul, my question was less about performance, but within these architectures, is it purely about how the data is presented to the applications or is it also have any, is there any difference between them in terms of uh, data protection, you know, preventing data from being lost if a node fails or something along those lines? Um, so we, we sort of factor that in, in the sense that we, we fully support synchronous replication um, across nodes. So um, like all storage OS features, this can be turned on per volume. And if you elect to, to turn on uh, one or more replicas, then you'll be insulated against node failure, subject to the sort of placement constraints that we described that we described previously. So essentially it's flexible. Just, just on that point, um, effectively, you know, as Paul said, every, um, every uh, volume has a bunch of labels that define the data services for that for that volume and they can inherit those labels um, so you can have like you know groups uh, or classes um, or you can choose to have every volume in a slightly different way um, which gives you you know the ultimate flexibility for you know volumes that need five replicas and volumes that need one replica for example or or you know different types of data services like compression or encryption for example of course, one more thing that's worth mentioning on this centralized storage model is those nodes on the outside, those N1 and N5. This is this this model lends itself particularly well to a player environment because, of course, we can build elastic fleets of nodes where we, we perhaps want to stand up lots of nodes for a portion uh, for a few hours, even uh, a portion of the day or a portion of the week as load demands. Now, that kind of elastic growth does not sit well with hosting stateful data because, of course, we need to move the stateful data off the nodes before we decommission them. But if we're running a front end only mode, then we can absolutely deploy elastic fleets, which can take advantage of stateful workloads and, and, and can run stateful workloads within our cluster. I'm curious about what the expectation is from a network standpoint for those nodes that are not hosting local storage. Like what's your expectation for the centralized storage for N1 and N5? Uh, is it, does it have to be 10 gig, 25 gig? Uh, what are you looking for here? So we try not to be too opinionated. We have clusters running, um, we, excuse me, we have customers running clusters on gigabit networking and that works absolutely fine. Of course, if you give us more bandwidth uh, and, and, and lower latency, 
then um, then then we'll absolutely use it. So we we see a mix. We see some gig, we see some ten gig, and we see some customers going north of that. It really depends on the deployment, but we try not to be too opinionated. Okay. Um, and one of the things that I've run into when you're doing, as you call it, the hyper converged approach, is that you can't scale your storage independent of your nodes, and that all the nodes have to have the exact same storage configuration, or things fall down. Do you have that limitation where each node participating has to have the exact same storage configuration on the back end? Uh, we, we, we don't have that limitation, no. So we fully support heterogeneous fleets um, with different amounts of, of, uh, of storage capacity per node, um, and we'll simply place accordingly. So yeah, we're, we're very comfortable with that, and we have customers running in that kind of configuration. But, and just to add on to that, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's some of those, those concerns that kind of drive, you know, some of the other topologies and people to move and, and have hybrid uh, topologies. Um, especially now that, for example, um, all the cloud providers are, are providing instances with um, uh, uh, NVMe, just local NVMe uh, disk to those instances, you know, so, so we can effectively apply the data services like the replication and the high availability to that really fast NVMe that's going to share it out to the rest of the, the rest of the cluster or the rest of the compute nodes. Indeed, it's a great way to extract additional value from those cloud instances. That ephemeral disk becomes very powerful when we combine it with some synchronous replication. Right. Otherwise, that ephemeral disk goes poof when the node gets rebooted or, or shut down, really. So we can certainly help make it less ephemeral. Um, and, and, and of course, it's, um, it's typically very performance storage. So it's, uh, it's great storage to use for storage OS. So let's talk a little bit about how we deploy storage OS. So as mentioned, we have here our five node cluster. And all of those nodes in the cluster are running uh, an instance of the storage OS container. That's that green cube thing. So how do we achieve that? Well, Kubernetes helps us, of course. So firstly, we ship as a container, minimal external dependencies. In fact, all of our user land dependencies are in the container and our kernel dependencies are mainline, mainline modules only. So these are things that are found in every Linux distribution that have been for many, many, many years. We're very lightweight, as mentioned, um, a CPU core and about four gigabytes of RAM is a sensible production minimum. Now, as far as they're getting us deployed, Kubernetes helps us here. So Kubernetes comes with a controller called the daemon set controller. Um, and that is a, a way for us to be able to mandate that we want one instance of our, uh, of our container to be running on all nodes within the cluster. The way our daemon set gets deployed, it's via our storage OS operator. So in Kubernetes terminology, an operator is of course analogous to a human operator it's, uh, it's an application which helps deploy and manage the life cycle of another application. So the storage OS operator is what you install first. That takes care of installation and upgrades and so on and so forth for the rest of the storage OS installation. So what's in the box? If we open up the storage OS container, what can we find? Well, philosophically, storage OS is composed of two pieces and each of these are running on all nodes within the cluster. First of all, we have the control plane, which is the intelligence, the brains of the operation, if you will. So the control plane in storage OS is responsible for all aspects of cluster operation, dynamic provisioning, volume placement, cluster health, and so on. And critically, it deals with the issue of disaggregated consensus, which we'll cover in a slide shortly. So the brains of the operation is the control plane. Critically, no data passes through the control plane. It's purely, it's an orchestration. And then the engine of storage OS, if I can mix a metaphor for a second, the engine is the data plane. So the storage OS data plane is, is the path the hot path for all of the data, which begins its journey on disk and, and wends its way across the network, perhaps all the way up into the container. All of this plumbing, all of this magic is taken care of by the storage OS data plane. So all of the data services in the product, the thin provisioning, the replication, the compression, the encryption, and so on and so forth, are uh, handled with, by, and exclusively by the data plane. We can dive into both of those two components in a little bit more detail now. So first, to talk through, talk through the control plane a little bit and explore this notion of disaggregated consensus. So when we were designing the control plane, we really, we, we, the, the fundamental observation that we made was the clusters are getting bigger. So we see customers deploying in the many tens of nodes and even in the hundreds of nodes. Uh, we see that increasingly commonly. And of course, scale is challenging, even in ideal conditions. We have sort of, uh, we have lots and lots of issues to orchestrate in a race condition free way. Distributed consensus is a hard problem to solve well in computer science, of course, for everybody on the call, very well, 
very well, well aware of that. Um, but also clusters are noisy. So they're very, very rarely under ideal conditions, they're noisy. We have network partitions, we have transient errors, we have load related issues and so on. So we need not just to be able to scale, but to be, to be able to scale in, an, in, a, in, a, in a noisy environment. We built our control plane sort of with this principle in mind and we came up with this idea of disaggregated consensus. The sort of fueled by the observation that network partitions can appear anywhere within a cluster. It's very difficult for us to reason ahead of time about where that partition might occur. Perhaps a node itself goes offline, perhaps a pop of rack switch blows, perhaps an entire routing domain or a BGP domain uh, or sort of sort of disappears, an availability zone, if you will. So rather than trying to reason ahead of time about that and try and mitigate it up front, what we do is, is, is we just assume that we can see network partitions anywhere. And each storage OS volume group, and by volume group, I mean uh, a primary and zero or more replicas if replication switched on. Each of those units sort of operates as a completely autonomous unit, a mini brain, if you like. Um, it acts as a, a, as a tightly coupled, strongly coupled group with respect to, 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 the, to the replicas, but completely independent of the rest of the cluster, the rest of the volumes in the cluster, the rest of the volumes on the node. Um, they, uh, they, they really don't talk much at all. And that's important because we don't have that single choke point of serialization at either a node level or a cluster level. So if we introduce a network partition, for example, between nodes one and two, you'll see that in this case, volume, the volume at the bottom has done the right thing. One of those replicas has become a primary, you've built another replica, and that volume has carried on moving, workloads have carried on moving. But you will note that the, uh, the top two volumes, or the, the middle and the top volume, haven't, haven't changed at all. There's no CPU cycles, no network bandwidth being consumed, no reasoning. Uh, they, they've just carried on moving. Similarly, if we, if we uh, introduce partition between nodes four and nodes five, we see the same effect. So that top volume has reacted accordingly and done the right thing. It's preserved our data and it's kept our workload moving. But those, those, the, the other volumes in the cluster have, have, uh, have, uh, have not needed to reason about it or, or maneuver at all. Now this, this architecture enables us to scale to many tens, of, again, in the hundreds of nodes. Um, and we scale effectively very well. Um, we, we, we test regularly in the tens and the hundreds of nodes um, and, and the system behaves well. Of course, it also means reduced blast radius during, during failures, during outages, because we don't see these kind of cascading failure effects where one failure leads to a cascade of kind of recovery events, causes additional problems, additional load within the cluster. Uh, right at the time when you need to avoid it because you've, you've, you've got you've got a kind of a, a, a brewing outage. Um, I have a question just regarding how it's going to handle when that that network partition disappears and it now has to sort of reassemble. So when that partition initially appears, does N1 know that it's now cut off from the rest of the cluster and kill the container um, and and wait for further instructions or, or, or how does it handle that initial partition? And then what does it do when that partition goes away and it's rejoined to the cluster? I just, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. That's a great question, thank you. So yes, we use some monotonic signaling. Um, essentially the current primary of the, uh, of, of the volume understands that it's, that it's a primary. And every time we migrate that primary around the cluster in the kind of event that we just described, that, that monotonic counter increases um, and some other signaling work and some other orchestration goes on under the hood. But the upshot is that um, when that uh, when that node number one rejoins the cluster, um, it cannot interfere with the data path. Um, it's, it's, it, it's not possible for that to happen. Um, so so the, node, the node will rejoin the cluster and it will decommission that replica and, and, and carry on participating in the cluster. But it's, it's, uh, it's not possible for those for any corruption or any uh, serialization issues to occur as a consequence of, of, of partition nodes rejoining the cluster. Okay, and the assumption is that Kubernetes will reschedule that pod on a node that is not partitioned from the network and it'll start using that primary copy instead. Indeed, so we, uh, I guess there are, there, are, there are two sorts of concerns here. There are, there are schedules about, concerns about the actual workload itself and where that lives. And those are somewhat orthogonal to storage OS's sort of activity regarding the, regarding the volumes. But suffice to say that from a storage perspective, yes, we'll do the right thing. Uh, the data will remain available and mountable within the cluster um, on, on, on the right side of the network partition. Okay. And like you said, when it rejoins the cluster, it's going to just blow away its replica and possibly create a new replica 
but it's not going to make what it has available for use. Indeed, yes. Okay. All right, so the other thing that we'd like to talk about with respect to the control planes that our operations happen very, very fast. And this enables entirely new patterns, entirely new workflows, which of course the world of Kubernetes containers, orchestrators um, is really bringing. So, so, so we're helping in that regard. Um, so what we have here is some, some graphs from our internal stress tests. And what I'd like you to, to notice is that the y-axis on all of these graphs is measured in milliseconds typically. And what that means is that all of our operations, volume creations and volume deletes and so on, all of those are completing in well under a second, um, even under con conditions of duress like our stress tests here. That's important. So we have customers uh, that are bringing, um, bringing workloads into being for seconds or minutes at a time, perhaps standing up an elastic search cluster, throwing some data in, running some tests, and then tearing that cluster down again all in the space of a, of a few minutes, many, many tens of thousands of times a day. Those sorts of operations are very challenging, if not impossible to achieve using traditional storage architectures. But with storage OS, they become easy. Um, and these sorts of new workflows become, become very possible and, 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 and compelling. Also worth noting that the, uh, the replica count does not, change, uh, does not change the response time. So irrespective of whether we're, we're creating a single volume or adding synchronous replication and orchestrating that across several nodes in the cluster. Again, it's all still sub-second in, in, in operation. Really, really interesting stuff. And, and these, these new workflows are, are very, very powerful. So we've talked a bit about the, uh, the control plane. Now, the second piece of the puzzle here is, is the storage OS data plane. So this is, this is really the engine of the product. This is, this is what's getting all of your data from disk up into your container. And we can view the storage OS data plane as, as, as as two components, they both run within the same container, within the same set of binaries, but there's a front end and a back end. So let's let's talk about those briefly uh, in 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 screen. So first of all, the front end of the data plane, you can see the container at the top of the diagram there. That's asked for a volume to be mounted, um, and, or, or perhaps asked for a volume to be created and mounted. So what happens is that storage OS is presenting on the node that's doing the attachment, storage OS is orchestrating and presenting a virtual SCSI device. So it presents as, as just another standard Linux SCSI device slash dev slash SD something. Um, and that, and, and, and that, that storage device, we orchestrate the, uh, the creation and the presentation of a file system and then the mounting into the container. So this is important. Storage OS is at heart a block storage layer. All, all, of, the, uh, all of the data plane internals think about data in terms of in, in terms of blocks. We, we are a block storage layer. So once we've got that container mounting that uh, the file system on that virtual SCSI device, we descend down into the data plane. And you'll know that there is a, a layer here, DirectFS. So DirectFS is our, our network block protocol. You can think of it as a little bit like iSCSI, but we've got some, some extra multiplexing in there and also some extra health checking, which helps us to uh, to 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 sort of uh, augment our control plane health checking with some inline data health checks that we can use to help fail over volumes and that sort of thing. So our direct first layer forms a, a data full mesh across the cluster. So we need full mesh connectivity across there. We build up a mesh and we can use direct to remote mount those volumes. That's the technology that, that, that allows the remote mount that I described earlier, but also direct to is what powers our synchronous replication. So it's our network block protocol effect. Moving to the back end of storage OS, this is where the data actually gets, gets stored onto the, on, on, onto the disk. Storage OS data plane, this, the, the back end really implements all of the data services. So this is where the compression happens and the encryption happens and so on and so forth. And what we're doing is we're using all the, all the, uh, all the storage that's available to the node at a specific mount point, that var lib storage OS mount point that you can see on the diagram there. We're bind mounting that path from the node into our container that's what we're using. So whatever the node can see, we can, we can see and we can consume at that path. So this provides, of course, a route to, to, to mount various, various volumes from various service providers into, into the node and thus to make them available via storage OS. Critically, if you give us multiple disks, multiple devices, we'll absolutely use them. We'll strike the reads and writes across those volumes. So this gives us a form of scale up to complement the scale out that, uh, that, that multiple nodes allows. And it's worth noting that each volume in the data plane is a, is a discrete combination of metadata and blob files. That's the on-disk structure that we use. Um, and it's that metadata and blob file combination 
this discrete pair volume, it goes a long way towards, towards ensuring that deterministic low latency that we described earlier. So that's a lot of complexity that we've just described. Uh, but of course, from a user perspective, we want this thing to be very, very simple to run. So like all things Kubernetes, uh, we integrate using kubectl and, and, and using the standard Kubernetes YAML syntax. We really do want this to be easy to drive. So there are three, three things to be aware of here. Firstly, when we install storage OS, it's important to define a storage class. This tells Kubernetes about how to find the storage OS device, sets up the appropriate sockets and so on and so forth to allow volume to be, to be, to be managed and mounted within, within storage OS from Kubernetes. When we want to create a volume then, what we need to do is ask for a persistent volume claim. So this is a standard Kubernetes term that describes a volume. Now with storage OS, there's a one-to-one -one mapping, a persistent volume claim maps directly to a storage OS volume. Here we've got uh, a, a, a persistent volume claim called PVC1, and it's five gigabytes in size. Note that it's going to be thinly provisioned. So when we create it, it's on disk footprint is going to be simply the metadata of a five gig file system. And, and when, the, when the actual block data gets written, then the volume will grow on disk as desired. What we do then is we, we, we associate that persistent volume claim with an application. So here we've got a Postgres database and we've asked for that PVC to be mounted at the standard path that the container expects. In this case, the slash PG data. So that container is gonna spin up and it's gonna get a storage OS volume presented at that slash PG data mount point. We can kill the database and we can have it restart elsewhere and that same data is going to be available. So fairly simple to describe, fairly simple in concept, but of course, a little bit of complexity under the hood um, and that's how it behaves. Now we try very, very hard to integrate with Kubernetes so sort of to follow standard Kubernetes semantics wherever we can. So importantly, we use the CSI, uh, the CSI layer, which is the, uh, the, 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 the Kubernetes standard way to describe, to, to talk to storage providers. And we fold into the standard, the, the native Kubernetes security primitives. Sort of, and this is what allows us to do multi-tenancy. So namespaces are, are, are the sort of the, the standard way to, 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 to segregate workloads within a Kubernetes cluster. But of course, if we want finer grain control, we have the full Kubernetes RBAC suite available to us, which allows fine grain control on individual objects within the cluster. So we fold natively into, into these constructs, making multi-tenancy very seamless. I have a, a question about the storage class. I'm, I'm not sure if you're gonna to get to this later, uh, but is sure. your recommendation to have a single storage class that points at all of the storage being hosted, or would you create multiple storage classes for different pools of storage? Maybe you've got different disk classes or, or something along those lines. Um, so we would recommend a storage class, um, typically a single one. Uh, the, 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 the possibility of multiple ones is if we want to sort of describe standard mappings for labels. So perhaps a storage class for replicated volumes versus unreplicated. That would be perhaps a reason to, to describe two storage classes, but only one required. Okay. And it would different, would you also do the same for different performance tiers or is performance something that's handled separately by storage OS? So performance is something which is handled very, very separately. Um, we wouldn't okay. need to, 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 to play with the storage class in order to influence that. So storage OS replicates data synchronously across the network. Um, and that's very, very important because this is what allows us to insulate against node failure. So here we have a container running on node two and it's mounting um, primary volume on node one. That primary volume has replicas on nodes two and nodes three. And what happens here is when the container issues a write, it pushes that write down to the primary. The primary pushes the write off to the replicas. The replicas all have to successfully out the right back, and only then does the right complete, and does the system call complete, and, 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 and does the right complete. So we end up in a situation where, where we have three identical copies of the data on disk. Now, in the event that we have a node failure, what we can do is one of those replicas we can promote to be a primary. We can spin up another replica and begin populating it. Note we can carry on writing during that during this, so we can we can. We can be busy backfilling the data in that replica while, while writes are continuing. And importantly, you'll note that the mount point has moved under the hood. So the, uh, the, the mount point has moved. The workload doesn't need to be restarted. It's simply had a short pause, just a few seconds in, in IO, and then it's carried on working. Completely transparent, no operator intervention needed and no application downtime. So I want to talk about locality a little bit. Here we have, um, a storage, uh, we have a storage OS volume on node one. 
we have it being uh, it's being being mounted by a container on node two. Now, of course, that's fine. That's flexible. That works perfectly well. I've described previously, but there are certain circumstances, certain data intensive workloads that we might like to co-locate the uh, the container with the with the with the volume. And indeed, we can do that. Of course, the performance benefit here is that we're avoiding a network round trip backwards and forwards. And so these volumes really, really do get faster. The way we achieve this is we integrate with the Kubernetes scheduler. So when Kubernetes places a pod, it offers us a list of, 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 of nodes, of candidate nodes, and we can return a sorted and filtered list. So we can, we can ensure essentially that our workload co-locates with our volume. That happens by default in storage OS clusters. And just to uh, emphasize the points, here we have a graph of a, uh, this, is, this is a using the PG bench suite. So this is, this is uh, measuring transactions per second on, on a Postgres instance that's running against a storage OS volume. You can see that the, the remote placement, that's a very healthy, very respectable 189 transactions a second, the commodity hardware, but it jumps up to 429 transactions a second as soon as, we, uh, as soon as we're running locally. So big difference there simply from influencing pod scheduling and placement. So I'd like to talk about encryption a little bit. First of all, we, uh, we encrypt all of our data in transit. So we use TLS. That means that all of our data is encrypted using the standards and secure TLS 1.3 Cypher suites. And of course, our endpoints are also authenticated using X509 auth. Um, and that, that really helps in, 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 in modern environments in which we can see bad actors both inside and outside the firewall. Um, so having protected endpoints is very, very useful. We also protect data at rest. So we encrypt volumes at a block level using uh, AES, it's AES 256. And each individual volume in a storage OS cluster gets its own encryption key. We store those keys as Kubernetes secrets. So this is the standard API that Kubernetes offers to store secrets. And of course, we can back the Kubernetes secrets with, uh, there are various different, uh, various different secure backing stores that we might choose to back those secrets. So HashiCorp Vault is one example, but there are, there are many others, of course. We do use the, uh, the, the Intel ASNI instruction set in order to accelerate that encryption. And that really means that there's a negligible latency impact to turning on, uh, turning on encryption. A key point to take away here, if you can forgive the pun, is that of course, the keys, these volumes are kept within your cluster, within your control as a user. You're not necessarily, you're not handing them to, uh, to, to a third party, perhaps a cloud provider um, or, or, or a service provider. Those keys to those volumes are held within your cluster. That's particularly important in some environments um, and, 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 and in some industries that have specific data protection requirements. Moving forward, I want to talk about fencing very, very quickly. So this is the observation that uh, the Kubernetes stateful set is, uh, is the standard way to run stateful workloads within Kubernetes. And we recommend use of stateful sets wherever possible. Uh, however, of course, the stateful set is by design and quite properly so. It's very conservative in terms of its, its pod failover semantics. So even when we lose a node, as in, as in the example here, you can see that the node has, 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 uh, has gone offline. Storage OS has done the right thing with respect to the volume. We've promoted a replica and so on. But the stateful set pod member is still co-located on node number one because Kubernetes cannot positively ascertain that, that volume has been correctly unmounted. So it waits, it waits for operator intervention. Now, of course, we know that that node has failed because we failed the volume over. So what we can do is we can augment the intelligence of Kubernetes by bringing our own control plane intelligence to bear. That means that allows us, that allows us to, uh, to, to kill that pod running on node one and to, uh, to, to cause it to be scheduled elsewhere within the cluster to keep that workload moving without operator intervention. So we, we, we support fencing. To share final, the storage OS supports uh, that the standard access semantic for, or standard access mode for a Kubernetes volume is read write once. So this is um, this is implies a one to one mapping between a volume and uh, and the consuming pod, and that's 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 traditional and standard for a cloud native workload. But of course, there are certain applications that that may like to share data that have been written with the expectation of sharing a file system between several pods several containers across several nodes within a cluster. Um, and and, and read-write-many is, is, is really made for this. 
we see this with our customers, particularly for legacy applications. So there are lots of, lot of, lots of applications out there that expect to be able to share a file system. File system is a message bus. I think we've, we, we've all seen many, many times. Read write many volumes are tailor made for this. And Storage OS supports this by orchestrating a user space NFS layer. So we, we, we use an NFS daemon. We closely couple that with the primary of the volume. Um, and each of those volumes gets its own FIP, its own Kubernetes service endpoint. So each, each of our read write many volumes has an independent VIP within the cluster. Um, and that moves with the primary volume um, as replicas promote around the cluster. So here you can see we have four Nginx pods and they're all accessing the, the same storage OS volume. Moving through, we have a GUI and a CLI. So both of these really operate as read-only panes of glass, just to, uh, just to illustrate the cluster. The CLI, of course, lends itself well to, to, to scripting and automated monitoring and so on and so forth. Finally, I'd just like to mention our Prometheus endpoint. So we expose IOPS and bandwidth on a per volume basis uh, for, for, uh, within our clusters. Um, now that's, that's particularly important. I've spent a lot of time in my career as a reliability engineer. Of course, it's really, really great to be able to get time series data that, that instruments our systems at such a granular level. Uh, traditionally, understanding what proportion of IOPS or bandwidth was in use by a given application was quite a hard problem to solve. We'd need to do various combinations of IO stat and IO top and so on and so forth to, to, to understand. But with uh, the storage OS Prometheus endpoint, we can get that, get that information on a per volume basis, easily available and presented within Grafana. So quick question, just wanted to clarify something. Um, I think one of the, if I understood correctly, just wanted to ensure that. Um, I think one of the statements uh, were that, you know, in synchronous writing, and when you have multiple replicas, um, you said that there is no time penalty because I'm, I'm guessing that that's because the other copies are sent in parallel. Um, but in general, synchronous replication means that, you know, the last write, the, the slowest write will be the latency that you get. So is that not correct? Are you basically somehow mitigating against that? It's, or is it's, it still it's, true? It's just because of the parallelism that 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 comment was made. It's very true. We're very proud of our engineering, but uh, we, we have yet to find a way to circumvent the laws of physics. So <laughs> yes, um, writes to a storage rush primary do push to, to the replicas and do require to be act back. Um, so so the, the latency of those writes is, is essentially the, uh, the, the max of the latency of the replicas responding. Of course, for reads, we service the reads directly from the primary. So, so, so reads are not impacted, but for writes, yes. There is always a penalty for synchronous replication. Nice. No, I just wanted to clarify because it sort of felt like somehow you're doing magic there. Uh, Thank you. For that, your technology is magic, <laughs> but not quite there yet. Very proud of you to say so. We're working on it. Good. Cheers. I, I had a question about the, the security with the certificates and keys. Um, you mentioned that they're managed inside of the Kubernetes cluster, but I know some customers are going to want to store the, the master key or, or whatever your equivalent is in something outside of the cluster, like an HSM or something. Indeed. Do you support that model? Is that something they can do? We do. So we quite deliberately programmed the Kubernetes Secrets API um, to sort of decouple ourselves from that conversation. So there are various HSMs that will happily plug in as backing stores for Kubernetes Secrets, um, and it's and 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 and, and we recommend that customers deploy with whichever is appropriate to their needs. Okay, so you're just relying on whatever the Kubernetes Secret backend supports. Uh, you'll Indeed. you'll support that as well. Okay, excellent. Indeed, Thank so. you. But are you relying on the Secret Store CSI driver for that, or are you just relying on native? Secrets. Yeah, we, we just rely on, on the, the plain Kubernetes secrets. So um, Vault will have a, a plugin for the, the secrets backend, uh, but there's also sealed secrets that we could use as well. 